Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is NIDIG. NIDIG's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, NIDIG is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using NIDIG, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory governance and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, NIDIG has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out NIDIG as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. My thought there originally was, okay, so to analogize it to Bitcoin, Bitcoin would eliminate the need for most banks, armored cars, et cetera, et cetera, in the long run. Like you may still have bank branches, I guess, but I think most of it would be done digitally. It's a digital native asset. Um, I think banks would only provide maybe custody and maturity matching in a free market at least. Yeah, so why do we use that? We, we use that because uh, to, to trust somebody else. Right. It's, a, it's essentially the existing system is a ledger that we can trust somebody, somebody else and, and Bitcoin removes all of that cost as well. So does this mean populations would move towards low cost energy centers as like kind of like they're building the bank of the city on top of the Bitcoin mining network? Would, would it, it change the I, gravity for cities? I, I don't know, but I, I don't, it will in some degree. Um, so th this, uh, paradox look we has two different uh, systems competing against so in one if you looked at Jeffrey West's scale and if yeah, you looked at if you, if you looked at a city and uh, kind of it's a network and the bigger cities have more crime and it just follows a just a path of distribution it's yeah, really yeah. so it's it's really interesting and then you have to ask okay why did those cities form that way right and those cities formed that way typically over trading lines, trading lines. Mm. Yeah. Right. Commerce. So, yeah. Commerce. Yeah. And, 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 and as commerce cha changed, different cities emerged to take advantage of commerce changing. Today we would say steamship lines and, uh, um, and, and containers. Right. Right. And, and you'd see different cities throughout time emerge um, mostly yeah. out of commerce. Yeah. Now what's happening. And so take that step one further around energy sources, which I, I it, because now you're playing, why does those cities emerge and going to get better and better and better? It's tied to something else we, we said. Mm -hmm. It's actually because that's where the, the, the best people are and the best information mm -hmm. and the, and the sharpest minds to be able to, to be and 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 so more people flock for more information but now as information is distributed around the world and commerce changes around the world differently and it's and information is free yeah. the very structure of that city that city may change so the may, and it may change just dramatically because now the structure underneath uh it, that it's information and it's an information highway yeah allows you to be anywhere Right, right, right. So then does the does digital space then absorb a lot of that economic density and then we just don't have dense urban cores anymore? We have more just Yeah, and, 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 and I, I don't know, I, uh, potentially um, over time. I don't think that that would happen any real time, time, uh, time fast, but you could see uh, if you take away an economic core Mm -hmm. that it's not needed anymore like look, look at the commercial centers downtown right now in any major city um nobody's in the buildings right they're still priced at that a high price right if they're still priced at that high price and and business value can't be there to be able to support that yeah 
they'll die. Right. Absolutely. The free market will change uh, change, uh, change that, and it'll uh, it'll be crushed uh, crushed in price. So this is going to be a long time, uh, long horizon change. But you could see if you if you just the, the biggest concept here is where where is it? The gr- growth is different. Growth of information is free, mm-hmm. and and growth of information means more and more free. Mm-hmm. And 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 so so that structural change to society is more and more deflation against what we've known all of our lives. Right. And so what that, what that means for different areas and what that, uh, um, it, 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 we're early in that cycle, but it's, uh, but it's a lot's going to change. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, so, Shifting gears a little bit here, you talked about this concept too, that, and this one I'm thinking about a lot. I, 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 I guess I have this intuition a bit that the digital age is really just getting started, like, as, as hard as that may be to believe. Um, I think things like Bitcoin are gonna radically amplify uh, the growth of the digital economy. I also thought, and this is sort of built on, uh, I guess, the back of something like Google Glass. The thesis behind that is the more we get the hardware out of the way, uh, the more immersed we will become in the digital and digital experience, if you will. So today, all of our experiences with digital media, they're occurring, they're mediated through screens, right? Through a laptop or smartphone, mostly. But this, this concept that you talk about in your book of digital twinning, where you're actually creating digital avatars of the physical world. So I guess it's not quite virtual reality, but you're sort of overlaying physical reality with, with data, relevant data. Um, and I think the example you gave there was, was Llama Zoo, how they were uh, radically improving a lumbering production process, I think by, by uh, visualizing and harvesting this data in real time. I mean, I just see that, like, my general thesis there, and I've mentioned this before, is that the world's becoming a video game. And it sounds like this could actually become that. It's like we actually start looking at the world through augmented reality, whether it's glasses or whatever the, the, the piece of hardware is. And we start to see, as we're trying to error correct or make better decisions relevant to our business, we can actually see the data in front of us. Like, how much, how much is this rent is this piece of property generating? Or who are the, the, the ledger of owners for this piece of property, whatever it may be. And we just get this radically enhanced uh, perspective on the world, I guess, by actually seeing the data that we have to work kind of hard to get to today through laptops and smartphones. And our biological computer, our brain, won't be able to handle that. Mm. This is too much information. So if you think about the information, I think I use this in my book. I can't remember if I used it in the book or if I cut this from my book. <laughs> but, uh, um, but if you think about everybody listening to this right now, how much other information is coming into the senses while we're talking from the air temperature to everything else around them. And, and what you focus on back to what we focus on, that's the thing we hear. We we don't even realize the other stuff going on. And so, so, um, and, and that's because we can only comprehend so much. Our brains can't, can't take in all that information, make sense of it. Yeah. So we, so we we have a whole bunch of shortcuts and everything else in our brains to be able to do to do that. Some of these some of these ideas for bases of knowledge that that we don't have to question those things again. That's how we get trapped. But so if you the other thing that's happening along with information growing exponentially um, is technology to be able to error correct. When when I say AI or or it coming to you in a way that you can comprehend it. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, along with, cause if we just had all of that information at our, at our fingertips without a way to sort that, what's, what's relevant, yeah. it would overwhelm us. Yeah. Interesting. So is this then, I think it was mixed reality was the term you were using. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like how, what, how do you see that? What does that look like? Like, um, so Microsoft is really deep, uh, uh, deep in here, um, as are others. But I, but I went to the Redmond facility and and walked on the Mar- on Mars, um, mm-hmm. and 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 
it, it, it's wild. It feels like you're like it's it, it, it feels like an immersive experience. And once you you're there, uh, you're walking around and you're you're and and that's that's today. Imagine with with sensors and everything else where you can feel touch things and and interact with uh with um this is all coming yeah um and the, so the technology is, is moving so fast into the into these domains again it's not broadly distributed yet if you have to wear a big sensor or, or like a google glass it just doesn't make sense yet it's not intuitive enough right now or to or hit a cost point that that's going to be commercially viable across everything else but every year the compute power every year and a half, the compute power doubles and those things get smaller and, and you're able to do more, uh, more with them yeah. at some point, whether that's, uh, wh whether that's uh, a contact lens that you put in or, or something else at some point that's going to radically change kind of your interaction with your environment. Do you see then that like the industry you reference in your books, the travel industry, $8.8 .8 trillion industry representing 320 million jobs. I mean, it sounds like if this tech became that immersive and that cheap and that accessible, that the travel industry, especially if there's a COVID like scare, I mean, the travel industry could get crushed. It, it, what it would, what it would feel like is, is so in Star Trek holodeck. Okay. And, and, yeah. and, and and if you if you actually could go somewhere and it felt like that or a real immersive experience, that is a fair ways off. But I'm using examples in in this existing technology moving forward, not a breakthrough of something uh, existing technology uh, moving forward. What you could actually kind of experience at very few people almost today, and then you project that forward and how much better it's going to get. It changes. I actually hate that I just uh, I, I put that in the book because I love travel. Oh, I, 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 I love travel. It's, a, it's one of the things our family does all the time. I've been, we've been everywhere. The um, I, I love uh, I, I, I love travel, but it's but again, a whole bunch of other industries have been broken. Yeah. Because um, because because the existing incumbents in the industry think it'll always look the same. Right. And imagine, imagine exploding my travel opportunities that I could go anywhere or feel like I've gone anywhere in real time. And now you've put, not just that's one dimension. Now you add avatars, other people that are doing the same thing with me at the same time in the experience. Yeah. It starts to change. We are living in a video game. Yeah. Now, now you get to simulation hypothesis and you take us off the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for that deep end. I don't, I don't know enough about that one, but it seems like it, at a minimum conferences, right. That would just become probably even the norm of conferences. Oh, for, for sure. Yeah. That's that, that, that will be the norm. I know a bunch of people working on that tech right now yeah. because, because, um, because it'll, uh, um, you can, you, you can expand that uh, scope a lot. Yeah, like I, I'm with you that I, I love to travel and I, I'm afraid of the thought a little bit of disrupting leisure or travel. It's like that sounds something like I would want to do my entire life. But certain types of travel, like conferences, I think it's very disruptable by something like that. If you could just yeah. jump in the same digital room with everyone and, you know, tr share the ideas and have a little bit of uh, at least simulated personal interaction, that sort of gets the job done. Exactly. Uh, what, what about additive manufacturing 3d printing we went into some of that in the book We're like, yeah and we talked a little bit about this just where that's going but just the the idea right in your head um being able to print that in your room or yeah. in, in your house um and it, it expands the ideas and and then on top of that those ideas it just if you think about information as an idea yeah. that goes through a supply chain of manufacturing to be able to come back to you right. and information being an idea that you can print right away that's coming um but on top of that ai is going to be attached to it and it's going to have an abundance of better ideas than any human uh put there that you're going to have access to so the abundance in this is it just it it, it these types of things radically change every industry around yeah yeah and so you were talking 
if we move to that, say, uh, I guess 3D printing becomes mainstream, then all of a sudden, like China's in jeopardy, I guess, because we're, we're, we're no longer, at least largely, in many sectors, wouldn't need mass manufacturing. So, it's, so that that becomes exactly the point. Like they, so a lot of their essentially hold down my labor rate, so I become the world's manufacturer. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and people buy from my factories. That changes radically. Yeah. Yeah. And then all that logistics infrastructure. But we're back to the blockbuster example. We have all this capex and this logistics infrastructure to get things cheaply produced in China, shipped to the US or wherever, all of that instantly goes from a big asset to a huge liability. Huge liability, and it happens really quickly. Now, re remember how much, uh, I can't remember what the numbers are right now, but the amount of a airline parts that are currently 3D printed mm -hmm. um, is a huge percentage of air airlines. So air it's, it, what's really, it's started in the higher cost industries and it's scaling yeah. lower and lower cost um, uh, all the time. But this is already commercially available in metal, metal glass, um, all sorts of uh, different products. Um, it, for a stupid example, our, our wake surfboard, uh, our wake surf boat um, has, uh, has a as a fin that you can make a bigger wave. Uh, and and uh, uh, my partner in it um, digitally printed one. It was an $800 part. He digitally printed the exact same part, just grabbed it off the, uh, off the inter internet. Because it, all it is is piece of information, right? It, yeah. uh, it's a prototype. Yeah. And digitally printed the exact same part for $2. Wow. Yeah, you made that point in the book that it's actually starting with a high cost low volume parts so these super yeah. customized pieces but they're also not only you know eight hundred dollars to two dollars but also in many cases increasing performance quality right performance quality yeah that's incredible like just to tie that all the way back into the theme of the book it's like that is the most sounds like one of the most deflationary forces ever so so again you, I, we've just explored a couple of industries and we could go through endless we can spend yeah. time to, like talking about some of these other industries and some of the ones invo involved in that the intersect and it's not just one industry it's the knock-on effects of that that we talked yes. about right and it's the knock-on effects of that gathering more and more information and information systems sitting on top of a horizontal technology that is artificial intelligence right. that is grabbing that information and doing it better than people how in the world if governments are, can't, are having trouble, kind of have to print $185 trillion over the last 20 years to stop the natural forces of deflation today and the consequence of that driving inequality right. today, how are they possibly going to deal with tomorrow? It's hopeless. It's, 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 it's hopeless. This thing, it, it, and, and so where are they? Are, is it, uh, and that's why. Going back to what we started started this show show with, um, this is a phase transition. This is a totally different system, and there is nothing that in the end governments can do to stop what what's coming with technology. In wow. fact, a lot of what they're doing is accelerating technology because if you're a technology company, the only way to compete is to to drive technology into your business so fast that you remove labor faster. Otherwise, you're going to be a ward of the state. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Another one um, example that comes to mind is I've seen uh, some documentary on the 3D printing of homes. And they were starting with more, I guess, just kind of standard homes. So they're like producing a lot of standard homes to, to help people have shelter. But they were building these things in 24 hours. Yeah, it's like crazy. A giant printer that sits on an axis and it was just printing a house from kind of the inside out in 24 yeah. hours. And we, when, when we look at some of that today, and, and so when you think about that, you think, okay, that's, I would never live in that house because that's the first thing that would go yeah, through yeah. my brain. And, but, but then you don't realize, okay, uh, what if there was an earthquake disaster and you had to do something really quick? Yeah. Um, and, and, what, and what that does to a change in a structure even in that and yeah. the existing supply chains that typically do, uh, response networks that do that. But that's just the first wave. And we, we always underestimate what lo uh, that looks like. In fact, housing might be one of the hardest things 
if you think about 3D printing to yeah. be able to all of that, that the componentry and what uh, what does it look like to actually make a house like we think we want today. Right. Um, so it's actually, even though it's advancing really quick, it's probably one of the laggard industries. Yes. Than, than some of the others that, that then build far enough and then back in into something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but to your point, it's like if it can be done orders of magnitude more cheaply yeah. and in many cases, perhaps even more, more durability or more yeah. utility in some of these things, like, of course, people may think, oh, I would never do that. But it's almost thinking it's like thinking 20 years ago, oh, I'd never jump in the back of a car with a stranger that I summoned on my smartphone. But now we right. all, you know, it's just the economics it's drive the behavior that th there's a thing it changed and it changes so fast and under you know this from Mises and everything else but un most of the things that we think about are is around an economics equation mm -hmm. right? we think it's something else but it's around an economics e equation and that e economic value some of the uh, some of the entrepreneurs that i uh, help or some of the industries that i see it's why the timing matters so much in this too um mm -hmm. because because if you miss that economic window, like uh, like today, we'll get into this in more detail later. But if um, solar for a long time, you could do all the things you wanted to by government and everything else. And people could say, oh yeah, we need solar, World, uh, uh, we have climate change and everything else. But until the economic calculation changes mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the equation for businesses to be able to drive that, right. nobody drives it. Nothing happens. Yeah, it doesn't it? Doesn't happen. It doesn't change, and and so. But when it changes, it changes everything else. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. That I, I think about the follow-on effects if it did. If three D printed housing did become a mainstream, I know it's a ways off, but then all the follow-on effects on labor, materials, real estate agents, everything. Like how many businesses are built around servicing the home, Home Depot, right? Like, right. It's right. uh, it's hard to imagine. It's, it just so radically changes everything, all because of again just a technological shift. It's like we used to build them this way, now we build them more cheaply that way. Yeah. If people for for some of the entrepreneurs that are listening uh, to the to uh, to, your, to your show, and it, a a place where where there's kind of an abundance of opportunity is if you looked at any industry, a lot of times it's it's designed for the wealthy in the industry mm -hmm. so so it, and a lot of the people at the bottom of the pyramid get locked out of that industry yeah um, and, it, and, and it consolidates and it consolidates and all of the innovation goes into that top top if you visa mastercard really good example and they they did top people banks top people top uh, most the richest people everything else and what does square do they go to the bottom of the pyramid and they use technology to drive a different efficiency. Their, their technology, their, their, uh, there's a good book around it called Innovation Stack. The technology and the design of the business is everything's designed to be able to reinforce itself and open up the bottom of the, the opportunity. Right. Same, and, and same thing what Amazon did in books. Yeah. Only the top publishers could have got in the bookstore. Yeah. What if we opened yeah. it up for everybody uh, in a bookstore and it start so it doesn't start where where all the money is it starts where very little of the money is and, but it opens up a need for somebody that starts the ball rolling interesting maybe that's that's connected to that wave of centralization and decentralization over time right all the right the wealth accretes on one side or the other of the pyramid so then there's more value to be created by disrupting the other side perhaps and especially with technology and what happens is if people get locked into a system and they don't realize uh, Blockbuster, all of these are, they don't realize that the technology now changed the rules that you don't have to be locked into that system. You can deliver the value a different way and open it up for a whole bunch more people. Interesting. Wow. And so, yeah, that, that really points to that. Uh, there's a great line in your book. So the simple power of technology is that it allows for abundance without the same amount of jobs or income if we let it. So it very, it's just the, the Archimedes lover, right? It's give me a lover long enough to move the world. And what's it, a fulcrum to move it on? And they'll do it. Right. <laughs> Technology is that lever. Just it's growing longer and longer. So I guess 
that takes us into energy then. So we've got the lever, the technology is the lever, but we still have to apply energy to the lever to move the things, to create um, the outcomes we want or satisfy the wants we're aiming for. And energy is a big, big business. You know, I think you said 9% of global GDP. Um, and it's, you know, this is common to Bitcoin FUD, which I'm sure we can explode here in a minute, but people want to talk about energy waste or energy consumption being a problem, but it's actually, that's what civilization does. It's like civilization advances by harnessing more energy, which even the term when we say energy consumption, I don't like, I don't think the term works because, you know, according to thermodynamics, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It sounds like we're destroying energy when we say energy consumption, we're actually just harnessing it. Um, and I think the number was, you know, we expanded worldwide energy use 1400% in the 20th century. So that was, that was all the growth. Um, but now as we shift towards, as we're talking about spatial growth versus temporal growth, it seems like that the longer lever of technology can allow us to make better use of that energy. So, and, and Bitcoin seems to be a key component of that, that it's a major, uh, I guess a system for monetizing energy directly, but also creating an incentive, global incentive schema that pushes market actors into unused energy sources. So there's a lot to um, uh, cover uh, cover here. Before we do, I want to say yeah. this: this and uh, um, from a um, after laser eyes which is a fun little thing to, <laughs> but after laser eyes, what I'd love to, the Bitcoin community to do is, is drive. I'm in Bitcoin because it saves the planet. Right. Yes. Um, there is, so in, in the, the biggest thing that everybody is missing ever is, is, is so, so yes, energy, uh, energy will move more and more will drive, Bitcoin will drive lower cost energy sources. Most of those lower cost energy sources today are renewable mm -hmm. because it's already now, renewable is now an economic driver and we'll, we'll explore that a little bit more. But, but what the world is missing is growth in the way that we've grown forever by manipulating money mm -hmm. can't work in a finite world. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so there is no possible way so it, 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 walk, walk through this from a, so today, today solar is coming on cheaper than all other sources of energy. And that's additive to the energy grid. And, it's, uh, and, and it reduces prices, not just of energy, but if energy is the number one input in all other things, all other things. So that is additive to the deflationary forces that we're facing. Yeah. And, and that should be a good thing. Lower cost energy, lower cost things, lower cost everything else. And that means we don't need as much labor to have lower cost as things uh, drive down. Diametrically opposed to that is I have to make prices go up mm -hmm. through money printing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what, that, what, what that means is, is all of the innovation that entrepreneurs are bringing to the market in solar or, or renewables or whatever that's additive to that at a lower cost, monetary policy has to fight and eradicate the game by printing more money. Mm -hmm. So an order of magnitude bigger problem for the planet, if, if, uh, if, if climate is as big a deal, and, I, and it's, it's a big deal, Yes. Um, uh, the uh, in order uh, uh, magnitude bigger problem is unless we find a way to to work in harmony with where technology and information is taking us, which Bitcoin makes sure we do. Yeah. It's, it's a full function to that. Uh, in order magnitude bigger problem is we have to grow at all costs against that. Right. Right, and that's a big big idea. Because, because it's so yes, right now there's a whole bunch of people in Bitcoin and everything else that are talking about the, 
okay, it helps in flare gas, it helps move energy to, to lower cost areas and it helps advance solar. These are all true. But the bigger idea is ask anybody um, how the existing system, how they're going to uh, square uh, uh, the existing system has to grow forever and will destabilize money to grow forever. Um, how is that consistent with uh, with uh, with a, uh, with uh, climate change? Right. It, it is the problem for climate change. Yeah. The so there. I don't know if you read the book Rational Optimist, Matt Ridley. Yep. yep. Um, you know, he makes the point in the book that we the lap of luxury we all live in today is because we we're able to tap energy sources, hydrocarbons largely, yep. that gave us this abundantly cheap energy, right? To fuel, and the number, I, the number I think he gave for the average American, it would be the equivalent of having 660 slaves pedal uh, stationary bikes, 24 by seven, 365, to generate as much electricity as they consume in their day-to-day -day habits. Mm -hmm. So, and we were, so clearly you can't do that with human or animal power. So we had to tap an energy source, which is, which, which is hydrocarbon. So it's harnessing energy at a higher magnitude is civilization in a lot of ways, but like we need to figure out how to do it. The problem is we have to do it cleanly, right? We don't need to do, uh, we don't, we need to push ourselves towards the use of more renewable energies or more clean energy, I guess you could say. And on that point, like solar is the ultimate, ultimate source of energy. But I think the numbers in the, in your book were two hours of sunlight falling on the planet per year, if it was adequately captured, would power all of the world's energy needs for a year. Uh, uh, yeah. So it, uh, it, a certain, uh, uh, I forget what the I forget what the area covered needed to be, but yes. Yeah. So it, the point is, it's incredibly abundant, way more than we need. We just need to figure out how to harness it. And to your point, it's the one, it's the cost of energy that's falling most rapidly. So that would be that's where Bitcoin comes into play. Is it becomes a a natural um, incentive, I guess, to build out that infrastructure to capture solar energy. Yeah. Well, if you know the direct. Yeah, there's kind of, there, and there's again in energy, there's so much to unpack. Yeah. First, it, solar is a uh, solar and wind are very small parts of the overall in, energy grid yeah. today. Yeah, but growing really fast. Why are they growing really fast? Because they're uh, uh, because they're now they're lower cost. Yeah, sometimes so low cost that they're free. Yeah, already. Yeah, and and so what does a utility do with free energy? Right, because the utility is selling you energy, and then and then it gets to night, yeah. and they need so they need to balance peak load and everything everything else. So 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 actually, Bitcoin could come in and actually help them balance right. by utilize, utilizing more energy when the sun's out. <laughs> yeah, and 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 balancing that, and that's actually why it actually helps that grid expand. But. O over time, that that entire grid will likely look more distributed and regionalized than it looks today, yeah. because solar allows that, and it'll be that interconnection is probably going to look more like a node network than it looks today. Whereas you could even think about plugging in your car um, to to help offset the peak power time. <laughs> yeah, back to the back to your back to your house, but a whole bunch of um, it, I guess the big change, just like we talked about in um, in in when the big change happens for self-driving cars, mm -hmm. the big change here is solar is already one of the lowest cost, cost energy sources. And so solar along with battery storage now means there's an ec economic incentive that it expands at the cost of other energy sources. Right. And, and that, there's nothing that can stop that from happening now. It's going to expand and it's going to expand. And, and energy is, an, um, is 9% of overall GDP uh, and, it's the, and it's the number one input in most other things to make them valuable or not valuable to us. Yeah. So the, the, 
if you have a lower cost energy source, you, you there's an economic incentive to uh, to do that, and that's driving to uh, across the world right now at a faster and faster pace. In fact, the U.S. used that lower cost energy source yeah. for the whole uh, uh, for the whole oil uh, fiat, the uh, petrodollar system. Mm-hmm. A military complex to be able to guarantee lower cost oil because it gave an advantage to uh, to to ec- their economy. Yeah, and so that's and that's still happening. China is trying to play into that because we can't go all the way to renewables today. Yeah. There's still lots to lots to uh, lots to do, um, but but that that entire complex, that entire structure of of the oil complex driving that value yeah. is going to break right. on, this tra- on, on this transition. That's a great point. So it, this calls back to our earlier discussion where the society emerges almost as a, around the energy network of trade, if you will, right? When there's, when there's economic density in a city, that's where the city uh, society expands and it's also true of the energy of, of hydrocarbons right oil where we have the military com- military industrial complex sort of manifesting around those networks um, so do you think that I guess a lot of that a lot of the existing infrastructure then is hostile towards the development of renewable energies but but it, but it doesn't doesn't matter now it was hostile now it realizes because of the economic value. And, and again, this is one of those things that's really important. It doesn't matter if it was a hostile. Once the economic, it changes everything and it becomes, now, now there's an ESG movement. Now there's a, now I have to invest in it yeah. because now I risk being a blockbuster moment if I'm just in, right. in, in coal, right? right, right. Now, if, if I just bury my head in the sand, it's over. Yeah, I can fight that for so long, but the capital cost into every infrastructure for my old business is is exploding, and the, and the new business is changing the rules. Right. And so, so it it because of that economic value, it drives a faster and faster cycle wave. Yeah. Uh, into that, and that market will be more decentralized. Yes. Than the previous market was. Right. Yeah, this is a great. Point. So the the. This was Swanson's law with so- solar, right? That yeah. uh, the price of solar tends to drop twenty percent for every doubling and shift volume. So it's kind of akin to Moore's law, in a yeah. way. And then to your point, it, because sun falls everywhere, right? I mean, more so, in, uh, but it's very decentralized. Let's say so you can't just uh, monopolize an access point to an oil well like you can with, with terrestrial oil harvesting. Uh, which makes the Middle East, for instance, such a contentious territory, right? There's so much right. oil there. Uh, that's just not the case with solar. So the, the energy source itself contributes to the decentralizing uh, structure of society, I, I guess, that's in right. many ways. And the other point you made that I guess Bitcoin plays into this as well is that the conversions actually between forms of energy is where we, we, we lose a lot of efficiency. We become much more inefficient. Uh, say when we're capturing... Uh, I'm sorry, when you're like uh, taking oil out of the ground, converting it into gas, shipping it, putting it into a tanker to give to another car, like every time you have to convert the the form of energy, you're losing efficiency in that process, where solar is something much more direct. Right. Um, We're essentially in in digging up old animals and plants that that died a long time ago. We're digging up sun that was on our earth a long time ago. That's right. Ancient sunlight. And and then, and then putting them through a through a distribution system to burn them in our, in our cars or or, or heater And, and that distribution system and everything else. We don't need to go through that distribution process, similar to what we were talking about the distribution process from your information in your brain to a 3D printer, what's yeah. gonna happen. Yeah. That entire distribution complex that, that supports all of that digging up old sunlight. Yeah. Um, and, and then burning that sunlight to come, uh, come back to, to get a, a part of the energy from the sun a long time yeah. ago, we short circuit. And, we, and, and, and that, that that seems like, okay, why didn't we do it a long time ago? 
and and the why are we just doing now it took a long time the 60 years uh, 60 years of actual solar actually being in market yeah. at really high cost to be able to hit a point a tipping point right now that it becomes the cheapest energy source but once it becomes the cheapest energy source you can't put that you can't put that back in the box right it is it, 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 innovation and it, and the drive towards making it better and better just because of, because of capital and the nature of entrepreneurs right. driving that is driving is going to drive cheaper energy and better uh, better utilization in a different grid structure. Yeah, it's like you were talking about in our last session when you unleash the entrepreneurs on this, right? You, you've unleashed yeah. you know, on the uh, place where there's margin or profit motive, you can't stop them. <laughs> And, and, and so why, if that is lower and lower cost and, it, and it's good for the climate, why in the world would governments want to print money to stop it? Right. 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 <laughs> wow. Yeah, this message really needs to get amplified. So, so that's actually why I said after laser eyes, let's tr try to figure out how to amplify this. We need a meme around this because... because uh, I, I, I asked uh, on one of my Twitter responses because Bill Gates is talking about all the money that needs to go into this right now. Yeah. And I asked him, the, I asked him that question and I would love an answer. I would love anybody to tell me why, uh, uh, how, the, how, what I just said it was wrong about because, because what the, what the printing of money is doing is, is, is it's destroying that gain to society. Yeah. Well, it's hard to think different, right? They're stuck in a <laughs> paradigm. Once again, right. I think about this a lot too. So there's an inverse relationship then between distribution cost, say to put whatever the thing is across the network, could be energy, could be information. There's an inverse relationship between the cost to distribute the thing and the proliferation of the network. So if we decrease distribution cost, we increase the proliferation of the network. And for energy, <laughs> that network is civilization. We decrease the cost of energy. We expand the reach of civilization. Really important uh, idea. And actually, you could say energy and information. Yes. Yes. Right. And, and so, uh, whether they're the same thing, but uh, but the but that, but that concept. When you see the world through energy and information. Yeah. You know, when you said living in the matrix, or we're living in a video game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Start to see more and more of where we're going. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Yeah. And what that looks like is a very different world than material things, digging up things and to be able to, the, the way that it used to work. Yeah. And then I, um, the other point you made in the book was that solar has radically lower cost of maintenance over its useful life relative to the hydrocarbon infrastructure. Yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to add, you don't have to add coal to the solar plants each, each month to be exactly. able to, you don't have to dig up coal to be able to make it work. Yeah. And you're, right. you're, so, you're, so you make a yeah you design a coal plant and then you have to distribute coal to it all uh, constantly. Yeah. Uh, solar uh, a, a solar farm you don't have to add anything to it. It's amazing. I yeah I learned so much about energy in your book here. That the, the last quote you just made about seeing the world through information and energy reminds me of the the Nikolai Tesla quote which I'll paraphrase, he says, I'm like, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, learn to think in terms of vibration, frequency, energy. Right. It's, everything is in flux, essentially. We think things are material, fixed reality, and we're, we're playing with atoms and stuff, but it's not. It's, you know, matter itself is, is energy. It's frozen energy. Yeah. Um, but it's all energy. And um, we are, we're rearranging atoms into things. Yes. And now we're, and we're going to be doing that differently in an information system. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's as if the idea is the blueprint and then it's the casting die or something for the, the energy that we, that we cast into it to make the thing, whatever it is. Right. Um, have you ever looked at uh, uh, type one, two, three planets or, uh, or solar? Is that the Kardashev scale? Yeah. Scale, yeah. 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 So, so we're not even a type one civilization uh, yet. Yeah. And, and so, and solar, and, and remember, this is no, no additional movement toward uh, no additional technology needed 
just yeah. the existing end of one, uh, one thing. But uh, but a type one a, a type one planet is when you essentially you can use all the energy of your of your of your sun, right? The the energy and 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 solar even solar wouldn't do that, right? Right, yeah, using a tiny yeah. fraction of it, yeah. Exactly, it, um, because you'd have to cover the Earth and solar uh, and, and solar cells yeah. to be able to uh, to do that. But you could do, and right now they're they're actually working. I saw something even last week talking about so, uh, solar uh, in space beamed down. Wow, wireless. And so, yeah, uh, and so 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 that that's technology that's available now, not scaled out and everything else. But this stuff is all coming coming. But a, a Type One planet, kind of all the energy from their uh, uh, from from that falls on the Earth from the Sun. Type Two, I think. It, sorry, Type Two is all the Earth from their near, near, near nearby star. Yeah. And Type One is all the Earth that fall all, that falls on the Earth from the nearby star. Which is really, I mean, that is the point that energy harnessing is civilization like the more energy yeah. we can tap into the more wants we can satisfy more cheaply right the more population we can support etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. it's a great way to look at it i so i have this um something i've been thinking about as well we talked about cost of production declining leads to network proliferation uh the book the sovereign individual goes into that as well is like basically in the digital economy by decreasing the costs of information distribution and transaction costs, um, that the, the you know these centralized centralized entities that we've come to think are the norm, like large centralized governments, large centralized firms, they would become uh, less useful because the, the, if you think about the purpose of a firm, it's to it's like a nexus of contracts essentially. Uh, to overcome the cost of information, but if those costs decline, then the purpose of the firm is is largely dissipated. So, I wonder. If, and I, I've started writing a blog series on this. It's called Sovereignism. And my, I'm just thinking out loud here. But so, communism. We had this command and control economy, where there's like one. You know, it's the ultimate central planner, right? The pricing czar. There's no price signal at all in the economy. There's just a group of guys that tell you how much things cost, which completely handicaps the intelligence and adaptivity of the free market. So we had, say, the USSR, Soviet communism, competing with something like U.S. capitalism, which was not pure capitalism, but much more free market. Oh, close, yeah. Yeah. So that model, capitalism, socioeconomic organization, was more energy efficient than communism. So what I'm trying to write about it, and I'm calling it sovereignism, but what it is, is really just purified capitalism. It's like get, get the central planning out of money and just really let the free market do its thing. That would be even more, the, the, the hypothesis is that that would be much more energy efficient than capitalism as we, you know, 20th century capitalism. So what I'm getting at here is like, how in the world can I quantify that? Is there some proxy measure to say, here's why, Here's why capitalism outcompeted communism because it was better at this metric. Is there a metric like that? So I, I think it's about error correction. Yeah. I think, I, th I think it's about more, more opportunities. So information, you have more information. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, we'll talk about this a little later in AI, but if you, the printing press distributed more information and you, yeah. it wasn't just a one way distribution. Yeah. It wasn't, here's all the knowledge you have to learn. Yeah. It was a two-way distribution. People could contribute to information. And as, that, and as people contributed more information instead of just heard from the church or state, yeah. where they, what, what spot they should have in, in life, as they contributed, you, you got smart, civilization got smarter and smarter and smarter. Yeah. Sci scientific method, Renaissance, smarter and smarter and smarter, and 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 you and you add, you're adding more information to the system, yeah. And and that information, as you add more information, there's a whole bunch of bad information, just like yeah. today, yeah. Right, but but there's these sparks of really great ideas that take humanity to the next level, and take humanity to the next level, and so if you if you have 
central planning that is or central planning in anything that essentially I make all decisions yeah. and I don't have the information that I don't have all the information. Right. That's what, and, and, and that's why it's a bottleneck. Yeah. And so our, our businesses have been designed around, around, so all a business is, is a collection of people, hopefully aligned on a big idea. And the more aligned, the more less bottlenecks, the more alignment around the vision and what to do. It's it's planning at a business, but in a, in a, in a big, and so it's really important in that um, to set up a structure in a business that allows learning at scale instead of a top down. Here's what to do. Right. But what, a lot of the businesses today that are moving so fast, or or startups that are kind of catch fire. Yeah. They have in their DNA a curiosity and a learning yeah. that can that can drive the best ideas and drop the uh, drop the bad ones. The whole agile process and technology is around that. Mm -hmm. So, so you can error correct faster and 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 then move forward. And large companies get caught into get caught into an organizational structure that prohibit that learning rate. Yeah. So, and, and that, for whether it's a large company, like Kodak kind of getting annihilated, but they don't see what could happen out of the, out of, out of that learning rates. They stayed into their, into the existing structure. And the same thing, if you just keep on playing any, any organization of people right up to government, it looks the same way. Right. It's just a collection of people under it. But if you centrally plan and I know better than the market. Yeah. You, there's no chance you could know better than market. Yeah, yeah by definition, you never can. Yeah. And so yeah, no, that makes sense to me. The the yeah the the siloing of information makes them. If they're not in error, if the central plan's not in error in the beginning, it will be at some point. Right. But right. it has no means of course correcting, right? Because it's not getting any signal back right. to the market uh, until it just collapses. I guess. And there's too many data points. So yeah. so today so. A lot of people that listen to this they say, "No, it's working for China," okay. um, and 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 but they don't know. No, it's not. The the only reason it looks like it's working from China is China has expanded its debt faster than any any country in in history, yeah. and and so the the China miracle is more of a debt miracle that they got together, and that debt miracle was created out of the U.S. needing a production base. Right. It was a codependency at first. It worked really well, and now you've hit a tipping point where both want. And so, so, um, but but if you looked at that in a narrow window, you would say uh, you, you would uh, in a narrow window of overall time, you'd say, "Oh no, it works." Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So, all right, that makes sense to me. The informational aspect of that. Uh, um, I, I think I, I've got a handle at the, there was a, a metric you used in your book, I think called the levelized cost of energy, L LCE, yeah. which is essentially a universal metric for comparing the costs of energy across different sources. That's right. Yeah. So my, that's what I'm, is there an LCOE that I, that you can apply to something like communism versus capitalism? Uh, I, I, I think these are frameworks or ideas that yeah. we get comfortable with um, and, and, and they have different meaning to each of us. Yeah. Right. So, so there's t today um, my idea of a free market is going to be totally different than, than someone else's idea of a free market right. or my idea of capitalism because of how I grew up is going to be a wholly different idea because, because the complexity of that, that word yeah. and what that means. And so is it a free market except for banking? And is it a free market except for when the banking bank should fail and then you, you give the bank more money. So it's not really a free market. And then anybody close to the bank, it's not a free market uh, for, for, but everybody else, it's a free market. Yeah. Um, if somebody else fails, they fail. Yeah. So where's the line and what does that look like? And, and, and so these, these words, these complex words or ideas, yeah. have been so so kind of brutalized <laughs> yeah, by, by by central planning 
by by I can I can overcome the system. I can overcome the information, and I essentially I'm going to make a better decision. I uh, for all of you, right? Because and 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 so it becomes really uh, uh, really mothering. Yeah, and it takes away from uh, uh, the free, uh, the free market, which infantilizes citizens. Right when you have this dependency on the nanny nation state. You're again. And, you're, you're not being responsible. Yeah, and and here's the and I think that some of the things that I'd love to discuss in this at some point, uh, in the series at some point. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna move to a Bitcoin standard or something like that. I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty convinced. Yeah. But how do you do that in a way that you could that you could allow for the rest of society to come with you? I think that's actually the most important thing that that we could talk about because if we if you can if we can decide if we can start talking about that not to say we're going to get here, here but that path because until you actually figure out what that path could look like or start to show that path it's really hard for people to leave their existing <laughs> World to, uh, to come yeah, over. Yeah, it's yeah. really hard to get a movement, uh, it, whether it happens anyways. But but if it happens anyways, without some sort of uh, th that uh, that uh, that path, then it's going to be really disruptive for for a whole bunch of Bitcoiners too. Agree completely. Um, that it feels sort of incumbent upon us to try and do some shepherding here and painting the vision of of a broader, better tomorrow on a Bitcoin standard. That's largely what I'm. You know, making an effort to do here and, and exploring my own thoughts about what it looks like and hopefully sharing with others. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, I agree with you, but it's also like, it's going to happen no matter what. So it's going to, it's going to happen. No matter best. What. It's like we do our best until it happens, but then it happens and I don't know how far we're going to get. But again, would you say, um, this is going, this is probably what I'm going to say is going to be, controversial in the and the bitcoin community but if a government let's just say you had a choice we all had a choice and there's a whole bunch of sovereign states mm -hmm. that we could choose to raise our families in right and and those sovereign states are going to be competing for for money and that money will a lot of bitcoin people in bitcoin will have that money okay yeah so they're going to be competing for that, and then they're they're also going to be saying, how do we how do we pro provide roads, bridges, infrastructure, medical, everything else, and and a society that other people can thrive into as we do this? Mm -hmm. What's a, what's your answer? What does a government do? I mean, I would imagine they would start collecting taxes in Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin and mining Bitcoin. So, so I think, so, so I think that that would, yeah, I think that would happen uh, probably uh, prior, prior to that, but at some point there probably has to be some sort of tax base to be able to, to, to do the shared services that people want. Right. And there has to be some sort of belief in a structure that allows that to happen for, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for providing people who do not have, yeah. there has to be yeah. something. Otherwise, society kind of breaks down. There has to be a shared belief system, and and this is a good thing. And pro and and as that happens, I would suspect that that regulatory environment, there will be will be some areas that do that way better than others and attract more talent as a result. Great. And so, so that's kind of how I think about those regulatory environments and what does that look like and where do you, where do you want to be? Not just on a regulatory environment, but what looks great for your family, friends, everything else, lifestyle. What does that, what does that look like? Yeah. I feel like the other big change there would be that it would be not one size fits all, right? Would, governments would be negotiating independently with citizens, basically like here, Here's what we're willing to offer. Here's our standard rate. If you're going to bring, you know, this much economic activity into our jurisdiction, maybe we'd concede on the rate a little bit. Like it would actually be a business negotiation. Versus yeah, it, it just might. It might be hard to do that as a business and go independently. It probably is too hard to do that as a business in, in independently. Maybe, um, 
Uh, if you depending on the it. nature of your business too, right? It, again, I'm thinking more digital native businesses where you have a lot of optionality on what jurisdiction yeah. you domicile in, where you move your yeah. capital. It, Et cetera, et cetera. Estonia today. Estonia today. You could uh, has a is a digital nomad mm -hmm. um, type of uh, type of citizenship. Yeah, uh, taking advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting to think about. But I'm, I think the main big point here, though, is that decreasing cost of energy. We, we can just focus on that metric. Decreasing yeah. the levelized cost of energy. The average. I guess it is an average actually. So just the, the LCOE, the more we can decrease that, the more we can increase or uh, accommodate the proliferation of civilization actually. And on, a on a caveat that you do not print against it. That you do not, yes, yeah, yeah. So if you print against it. Because then you're not decreasing it technically, right? You're, you're increasing everything else. Right. So to, right, it, to right. offset that decrease. So to allow innovation to naturally decrease the levelized costs of electricity and have it the civilization running on a monetary standard that shared those benefits with the monetary system right right the, so the so to me that it, money that's the big idea that there that bitcoin there's not enough people in bitcoin talking about the big idea is bitcoin forces that to happen yes exactly N nothing else does because right. the existing system is going to keep printing to stop it, yes. and Bitcoin forces that trans trans transition from both sides. Right, it's sides. it's incentivizing you to decrease levelized costs of electricity to compete in Bitcoin mining, and it's also an absolutely inflexible supply that's capturing that's rendering all the value from that decrease. That that forces that forces that that deflationary that that abundance gained from technology to society abroad. Yes, exactly. That's the that, that's the point. The biggest the biggest point first point everybody should make is that one. Tell me how any other system but a system that does that can work. It in, generates in, economic surplus and distributes it. And distributes it. Every other system, if you try to create an inflationary system against that the only way you're successful is by pushing up prices and consolidating power right. to this to the state right yeah and, and and against that so you're concentrating power versus yeah. versus distributing it to not and power here i'm not just saying energy but but uh, but they go hand in hand yeah exactly but they go hand in hand yeah. you're concentrating all decisions and in, into into an entity which typically gets controlled by the biggest thug eventually yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, or you're a lot, or you're using Bitcoin, um, and energy moves and everything else moves, uh, lower cost. It, 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 for, it's a forcing function to allow deflation to broadly be shared. It's beautiful. It really, it's Bitcoin is literally power to the people. <laughs> right. it, it, it really is. It's that big an idea. And, and it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting that the, that the people most hurt by the inflationary policies and the people most um, hurt by uh, but, uh, the climate change activists who believe in the inflationary policies yeah. go hand in hand when this is the thing, they, they, it's the opposite side of this that actually saves both. Right. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, we, we're not going to get out of this with legislation or carbon tax credits. It, it needs to be an actual free market incentive that again, we're, we're the greatest force for problem solving in the world are entrepreneurs. So right. this is what Bitcoin does is unleashing that entrepreneurial force on solving this problem we call climate change. Right. And there is, and, 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 and you could say that like, so go back and let's just uh, drive into that question a little, a little bit more. And I, and if you were in the climate change debate, you would say, yeah, okay, in the capitalist system, you'd say, okay, it needs checks and balances because the entrepreneur will win for themselves and the externalities to our environment, they won't capture. Right. Um, and it'll get worse and worse for the environment and everyone else will have to pay the externalities while they grieve the game. Right. And there's actually an argument that that's true. But today, the externalities on solar are positive. 
Yes. Because the price is now lower and it's clean energy. Yes. Yes. And we, there's other, there's second order externalities too, which we exactly. going to in the book, which is, a, yeah. so we get cheap energy, cheapening energy, driving an in, uh, increased proliferation of civilization. But it also makes things like the desalination of water economically feasible. Right. We can already desalinate ocean water today to make it potable drinking water. It's just a very energy intensive process, which is why we <laughs> don't do it at scale. And you can also, the same type of technology that desalinates water, we can use to strip carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. It's just an energy exactly. intensive process. All of these things are energy problems and uh, solving energy solves those problems too. And, and a bunch of the, the, the irony of uh, that, wa that water problem is that water, uh, um, that w water problem, most of the, the really tough areas to live, kind of refugees, food crises, everything else that put pressure on other systems that don't have that. But if you said migrants from Africa to, uh, to Europe and everything else is to escape, um, uh, escape famine, escape uh, a whole bunch of things caused by the same thing. And now you have energy that's where, sun, where the sun's shining all the time. It's, it's free. Right. To be, able to, to, to be able to change that economic value, both of water, sun, energy, everything else. And it changes, it changes agriculture. It changes a whole bunch of other th stuff as a result of that calculation. That's incredible, honestly. I think this is why we, you know, without looking at other domains, just staying in energy, this is why people in the Bitcoin community are so hyped about the meme Bitcoin fixes this. Yeah. So we have, we have Bitcoin serving as a global bounding program to make energy cheaper. And then as a, as a totally, uh, perfectly inelastic supplied money, it's sharing those gains evenly across its network. Right. And that now just not just add energy. Now everything it shares. Yes. It makes yes, that's right. yes. <laughs> all technological advance, all productivity gains. It's, 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 shared, it's shared. Yes. The entrepreneur still wins more. The, yeah. the, if you deliver value to society, you still win just yeah. in a free market system. You'd win more. If you deliver more value, you deliver more, you, right. you gain, gain more. But you have this more. option to also not, expose yourself to the vicissitudes of the market and instead just hold the money and benefit from it too, right? right? If you're an older right. guy going into retirement or something. So, right. and then the last piece is this, like when we get cheaper energy, other technologies that already exist, these are already viable technologies, ocean desalination uh, and decarbonization of the atmosphere become economically feasible. So all of a sudden we get these tools to, to clean up the damage that's been done. It's like, what, if, you I, just, if it just did that, we stopped there and said nothing else about Bitcoin. It's like, oh my goodness, this is one of the most profound innovations of all time. And, and it is one of the most profound innovations of all time. It's, and, and not that there haven't been others, but like I said, yeah, um, innovation works in idea, 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 put these things together, next step, yes. and humanity advances by those giant steps. Yes. Bitcoin is one of those steps. Yes. allowing an advancement of humanity to a, to a different degree and on a different platform that we're not used to. Right. It's it, it and it's, it, and to, to me, it's, uh, it's not, it's not scary. It's, uh, it, we, these things need to be worked out, but it's actually the most human thing we could do. Completely agree. Yeah. It's, we're getting back to the principles of the free market, frankly. Right. And, and in many ways, we could say and, and not and, and not concentrating power into uh, certain certain individuals' uh, hands. We're we're sharing that broadly. Yes. Yeah. Which is the I would argue the best side of human nature is that it's when we're functioning cooperatively towards solving bigger problems yeah. that, that we face across time. Right. Which right. energy is the the bottom of that basically. Yeah. Um, Wow, this is, uh, yeah, really enjoyed the discussion on that. That was really good. And then the, this connection, again, you know, you alluded to it earlier where it's, you know, geopolitical power and energy, they're kind of a reflection of one another. 
markets. Whatever mm-hmm. entity is controlling the energy networks or benefiting from them, they, they have political they have political power in the world. And 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 that political power is actually breaking down right now because of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Or it will break down. It's not quite breaking down down yet, but it's uh but 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 this path changes that uh, change uh, this path to abundant energy. Yeah, changes that. Yeah, so renewables, uh, accelerating technological innovation, all of these things break down those power structures. We we, we lived in a world for forever, looking through through that it, where where we needed to control natural resources and energy, mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 other and and countries were invaded or. Um, or <laughs> puppet leaders or anything else to be able to control uh, to be able to control that energy or natural resources and everything else and and that that is changing. Natural resources are still important. They're still uh, they're still critical natural resources in this whole in- infrastructure. There's even to make solar panels and everything else. But a bunch of the things that the entire industrial complex and, and war machine went to war over yeah. to be able to control these is changing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. All right. So what, I mean, this is such a complex domain. Like, I feel like we've, we've touched on something here that, that like to your point, we need to meme this into reality because it's complex to understand the, the relationship of Bitcoin to the environmental side of, uh, of the world. What is it? What is the elevator pitch? What would you say to your just standard environmentalist that's saying "poo poo Bitcoin"? Is a lot of energy. I would do this the same with the same thing. I would ask them to explain um, uh, how an existing system that promotes uh, inflation, that prints money, um, is uh, and has to grow forever, um, uh, is is in line with saving the planet. Bingo. That's it. So it's just so uh, it, because because it's illogical, right? It's, it's it's impossible to attain. Yeah, assuming uh, yeah, assuming they understand that it's debt based. So, 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 so just think about it. Uh, the, the I'm going to grow forever. I have to grow forever. More more stuff forever on an ever and ever increasing uh, rate. And to get that growth, I'm going to just distort money forever. Yeah. How is that? Tell me, have anybody tell you, explain to you how that's consistent with, uh, with a planet that, that can, uh, can work on a finite planet? Wow. It's with climate change. And, so, and, and, and then if you connect it after that, the dot to, to the, the, the technology is driving lower costs. It's exactly the opposite side of that scale. So you have to, you have to print more money to offset it. To make and, and so every single dollar that you're printing to be able to say save the climate, you're making the whole thing worse. Wow. Brilliant. It's yeah. It, inflation is irreconcilable with environmental conservation. It's in, it's irreconcilable. Yeah. It's impossible. <laughs>